Good morning, everyone. If I could encourage everyone to, to find their seats, uh, we wanted to go ahead and get started. Good morning and, and welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, seeing how, how full the room is, I think maybe the introduction I'm about to give might be superfluous since I think we all know why we're here. Um, and I think it's because we're all anxious about what's going to happen in four days. Um, sitting around a table in Vienna, negotiating, sipping coffee, maybe munching on some strudel or soccer tort, uh, might not seem very momentous, especially at a time when terrorists are beheading Americans, Iraq and Syria are falling apart, uh, Russian tanks have rolled into Ukraine, uh, Ebola is still raging in Africa. But the outcome of the negotiations that are currently going on and, and that we hope to learn more about on the 24th, on Monday, what happens, good deal, bad deal, no deal, some deal, will have greater consequences than any of these national security challenges we're currently dealing with. It will have consequences for the security of our nation, for the peace and stability of the Middle East, for the spread of radical Islamism and violent extremism, for the international non-proliferation regime. It will even, and I'll put on my hat as a bipartisan here, have an impact on the tone and tenor of our own domestic politics. At a time when the executive and legislative branches seem to be poised to either move past gridlock or fall back into the abyss uh, of partisan acrimony, how a potential Iran deal will be handled will help determine how we govern for the next two years. So much is at stake that not only have we put together this rainbow coalition of organizations that each do outstanding work on their own and yet wanted to come together, the Foundation for Defensive Democracies, the Foreign Policy Initiative, and the Bipartisan Policy Center, but we have now put on three events together in the past four months to talk about the importance of a deal that can credibly prevent a nuclear weapons capable Iran. We're going to continue that discussion today with really expert panelists talking about what to expect on Monday, if there is a deal, how to judge it, if there isn't, what happens next, and the role that Congress can play in all of this. Uh, but first, however, it's, it's my honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Representative Ted Deutsch, serving the 21st District of Florida. Representative Deutsch is the ranking member on the House Middle East and North Africa Subcommittee and a leader on issues related to Iran's illicit quest for nuclear weapons. He is the author of several important measures which gained bipartisan support and became essential elements of the Iran Threat Reduction Act. So everyone, please help me welcome Representative Deutsch. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, coffee has not yet kicked in. It's nice. Um, it's uh, it's nice to be here today, uh, just days ahead of um, uh, a day that we've all been looking forward to with um, uh, with great interest, and in a day that I think. Um, um, so many of us have been speculating about what we're going to hear, and um, I think that's, that's what I've been asked to chat a little bit about, and I'm happy to. Um, thanks, um, thanks to FDD and, and the Bipartisan Policy Center and Farm Policy Initiative for hosting today's uh, really timely event. As I said, we're just days away from the November 24th deadline, and I can't say that there is widespread optimism on Capitol Hill that a comprehensive deal will be reached. Um, I don't think that should be surprising since uh, we've not heard uh, tremendous optimism coming out of the talks. Uh, so the question becomes then, what, if anything, is possible on the 24th? And um, I thought I'd just lay out... Uh, a few of the possibilities as I see them. The most likely scenarios, if there is going to be some progress forward, obviously one of the scenarios is that there will be no deal with a set of ramifications uh, all to itself. <clears throat> but of the likely scenarios, if there's to be some big announcement, uh, one would be a framework agreement uh, with an awful lot to fill in, and I'll talk about that. Or there may just simply be an announcement of an extension of the talks. <clears throat> now, the administration has signaled from the beginning that no deal is better than a bad deal. And I would just add to that that uh, Congress, uh, and I, I know from speaking to so many of my colleagues, that um, Congress uh, will uh, not be satisfied with a bad deal. 
And I'd like to just clarify what we need to see, what I think is imperative to be included in a comprehensive deal, or if there is a f going to be a framework announced, then I think we need to see how we're going to, how that framework will permit us to get to uh, these points. First is a closing off of all of Iran's uh, paths to a, to a bomb, whether that's via enriched uranium or plutonium from the Iraq reactor. Second, uh, any agreement has to address both Fordo and Natanz. The, an agreement, if there is to be one, must resolve PMD issues. Uh, for me, the fact that we have now made it to this date, uh, this late in the process, without any indication on the fundamental issue of uh, Iran's uh, past actions and the mil possible military dimensions of the program uh, makes it hard to envision how we can move forward on all these other issues. I hope we do. Uh, but clearly, resolving PMD issues is imperative. Uh, next, and perhaps the issue that's taken up uh, so much of the conversation, is the dismantlement of Iran's centrifuge program in order to prevent Iran from becoming a threshold nuclear state. Uh, we need to see in an agreement uh, one that prevents Iran from acquiring the materials needed for advanced centrifuges. There must be a robust verification and monitoring regime to prevent any covert breakout. And finally, a point that I don't believe is discussed often enough, uh, if there is an agreement, it must cover a, a significant enough period of time. It must be long enough uh, so that Iran will not simply wait it out before the agreement expires and it is then in the position to move full speed ahead. Uh, now, as far as a possible extension goes, uh, any extension, if there is going to be one, has to have a clearly defined expiration date. Uh, the Iranians can't drag out negotiations forever while simply taking minimal action to continue receiving infusions of cash. Uh, that current approach cannot become the status quo. The administration must only grant an extension. The P5 plus 1 should only agree to an extension if they have seen Iran make enough progress to indicate that a deal is within reach. And that has to become apparent to any of us who review that deal. And finally, and I think this goes without saying, uh, there should not be simply an extension for the sake of, con uh, of continuing to talk uh, if that extension comes with added uh, benefits to the Iranians. Now, with respect to sanctions relief, sanctions relief will come only in a deal, an extension or framework, if Iran meets verifiable benchmarks. They have to be clear, and Iran has to clearly meet them before any sanctions relief is granted. If Iran continues to cooperate with the IAEA, then significant sanctions relief cannot be granted until it comes clean, as I said before, on the military dimensions of its program. Congress, and I think this is important to note as we gather on Capitol Hill, Congress will continue to play a significant role uh, in the discussion of sanctions relief. As the architect of the sanctions bills imposed, the, the sanctions imposed by the United States, Congress has to play a role in shaping the policy going forward. Uh, that the notion that sanctions can be lifted entirely without first coming back to Congress after Congress has imposed those sanctions to begin with uh, is one that will be hard to um, uh, pass muster here on the Hill. Sanctions are rendered meaningless, <coughs> excuse me, meaningless if businesses are allowed to flood into Iran. It is a real concern that some uh, uh, some willingness to grant sanctions relief, uh, which would then arguably uh, provide only limited sanctions relief, but would then open the way for foreign investment and a huge spike in foreign investment in Iran, uh, would also make it exceedingly difficult to put a sanctions uh, regime back in place. Once the genie is out of the bottle, once the companies flood into Iran, uh, it's going to be exceedingly difficult, I believe, uh, to go back if the Iranians were to uh, stop complying with whatever agreement is reached. And we can't forget that sanctions were enacted, and this is the key point, sanctions were enacted to halt Iran's nuclear weapons program. That's why Congress uh, over the past years have worked so hard to impose them. Sanctions were not imposed. Uh, Congress did not work so hard to pass sanctions legislation and work to ensure that those 
uh, sanctions were implemented simply to get Iran to the negotiating table. Uh, if that were the case, unlimited extensions would be perfectly acceptable here and uh, with our allies. That isn't the case, and it's particularly not the case here. So finally, <clears throat> I'd like to commend the administration for the work that it has done to unify the international community to pass and enforce sanctions over the past number of years. The, the substantive and serious negotiations that we have seen taking place uh, are, as I said, they're very serious. And we hope that they succeed. I hope that they succeed. But we cannot accept a deal simply for the sake of a deal. And should talks, I'll close with this, should talks continue past November 24th, Congress, I believe, should be in a position to ready new sanctions that would go into effect if Iran either is found not to be in compliance with any current restriction or if a deal is failed, if they fail to reach a deal by the end of the extension period. If they fail to comply or there is no deal at the end of what would then be the final extension period, sanctions should then be in a place to kick in automatically without having to have another exhaustive debate on Capitol Hill. Um, I think that is consistent with the approach that we've been taking. It's consistent with the position that was laid out when this last extension was granted, that this was, in fact, going to be uh, the time where we find whether or not there is or is not a deal. If another extension is, is granted, uh, it must be clear, and the way to clarify that this would be the last one is for Congress to act to show what will happen at the end of that period. Uh, so with that, again, I'd like to thank FDD. I'd like to thank the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Farm Policy Initiative for holding this event today. And um, uh, I um, will, like all of you, uh, eagerly look forward to the news uh, over the coming days. Thank you very much. And thank you. did you have a question? I, 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 I did want to ask I, okay. very, very, very quickly. Sure. Um, you, you laid out very clearly your vision of what a good deal will entail. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you maybe a quick series of questions on how widely you think those same principles are shared by your fellow members of Congress and, and whether you feel like the administration ha has taken those into advisement in its negotiations with Iran. Uh, well, I think that the, what I've laid out is... is um, Fairly well. That's a fairly well established part of the approach. Um, dealing with Natanz and Fordo, um, shutting down the centrifuges to prevent Iran from becoming a threshold nuclear state, uh, making sure that uh, that there's no path uh, to a bomb through Iraq and, and through uh, uh, the heavy water reactor there, uh, and coming clean on the the past military dimensions of the uh, uh, of the program. Those are those aren't. There's nothing that I've said here that's new. It's very consistent with the approach that's been taken. Uh, if anything, I, I hope that uh, by laying this out, it's simply, by my laying it out, it's simply a reminder of, of uh, what have been the guiding principles throughout, both for the administration and our allies at the negotiating table uh, and for my colleagues on, on the Hill who have also maintained these uh, same standards. Yes, I see uh, Mark Dubowitz in the front row really itching to ask a question, so maybe we'll let him get the last question in. Uh, sure. Okay. So, so the question I have comes from Deutsch. You, you played an instrumental role in, in uh, pushing forward the Iran Threat Reduction Act, particularly sanctions against all of Iran's illicit activities, the Revolutionary Guard. And the administration has said that it's going to suspend the vast majority of sanctions after a nuclear deal while bypassing Congress. And you and 343 members of the House uh, said no. You affirmed that the concept of a nuclear-related sanction in law actually doesn't exist. And that these sanctions are, in fact, hybrid sanctions that apply to a range of crimes, illicit conduct, including ballistic missiles, terrorism, money laundering, and other issues. Um, so the question I have for you is, since that, that letter attracted such deep and wide bipartisan support, what, first of all, what could Congress do to ensure that the administration does bring this deal to you? And second, what can Congress do to defend the very sanctions architecture that you, that you built, in many cases over the administration's objections? Well, um, well I, to the last point, I would say um, 
that there is there has been a uh, there has been a history over the past several administrations of Congress uh, taking a position that it has then uh, worked to uh, to ensure that each of the last couple of administrations have worked to uh, to enforce. Um, I think there are two different points you make, though, Mark. I don't know if everyone heard uh, the the first. I, I think there are there's the issue of the remaining sanctions that that don't uh, apply to the nuclear program that have to do with human rights and support for terror. And I think the administration has been clear, and I hope they'll continue to be clear, that on, on those, there is, no, uh, there is no linkage here, and that, and I've been, I've been told this directly, and I know a number of my colleagues have as well, uh, that as Iran continues to, uh, to violate the human rights of uh, so many of its citizens, uh, as it continues to support terror groups all throughout the region and all throughout the world, uh, that and sanctions that pertain to those activities um, should and must remain in place and must be uh, ramped up. There are this is uh, this is not a negotiation about um, uh, about rapprochement with Iran. This is a negotiation about preventing Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, the the behavior of Iran on these other issues uh, that warrants sanctions. Uh, we have to ensure that those sanctions will remain in place, and I, I believe that's the position. Uh, I trust that's the position of the administration. Now, on your your other point, though, about ensuring that the nuclear-related sanctions that Congress put in place will uh, will remain in place, and what role Congress will have, uh, I, I we all I think look forward to to seeing some details uh, if there is some framework or some. If there's some announcement to come uh, on the 24th, I don't know. Uh, I don't. I I've not been convinced that uh, it's possible to simply waive the sanctions regime that the Congress has put in place, uh, even with the suggestion that it's only temporary. Uh, because if if by temporary we mean a year or five years or or 20 years. Uh, that still, in that circumstance, I think, is significant enough that it warrants Congress's, uh, Congress's involvement. The sanctions regime that was put in place that helped drive Iran to the negotiating table uh, was put in place in the United States by Congress. For there to be sanctions relief granted, uh, relief of the sanctions imposed by the laws passed by Congress, then Congress has to play a role in making that determination. And I, uh, and I certainly hope that if there is an agreement, if there is a framework, if we see something that will uh, include talk of sanctions relief, uh, that certainly with respect to the sanctions imposed by the United States Congress, uh, that Congress will have to play a role, and and um, and that's a position that I've been clear on throughout. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Now, because we are both bipartisan and bicameral, we'll have Senator Kirk joining us a little later in our program. Uh, but first, in our game of musical chairs, we're going to call our panel up to join us for, for a little while at least until Senator Kirk shows up. Um, and I'll introduce them in no particular order. Um, Mark Dubowitz, who is sitting down now, is a leading economic sanctions expert who has written 15 studies on sanctions and sanctions relief. He is the director of, of uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracy's new center on sanctions and illicit finance. Uh, I'll, I'll try to go in order of the table here then. Uh, Ray Take at the very end of the table on, on my right is a senior fellow for, for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Mark Dubowitz, I just introduced. Uh, introduced. I apologize. Uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman served as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and other senior positions in the Department of State and the White House. He serves on the Board of Directors of the Foreign Policy Initiative. And right next to me, Dr. Ali Heinenen served for 27 years at the International Atomic Energy Agency, including num as number two at the IAEA in conducting inspections in Iran itself. Um, so, so with that, um, I, I think why don't I kick it off with, with the simple question that's on all of our minds, um, which is what are the chances that we're going to see a comprehensive deal four days from today on Monday? Anybody have an opinion? <laughs> 
Ray, why don't you start? Uh, Ray, why don't you start? Well, I'll start from here. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm, I'm not particularly um, sanguine about the possibility of a comprehensive final agreement, uh, but I do think uh, the, the 5 plus 1 have to come out with something. Uh, so far, by my accounting, I have not seen in negotiations between Iran and 5 plus 1, going back to all these time and Laura Johnny, where the Iranians have not come out and said they have made progress and this is a good thing. I just have not seen that. I, so I think that kind of a declaration is going to be insufficient to convince those who are skeptical of this. So I think they have to come out with some principles that they have agreed to. A framework agreement is kind of a precarious thing because everyone will see what's not in the framework agreement. Uh, and if some important issues such as enrichment capacity are not there, but I do think they have to come out with some declaration of principles or agreements as opposed to just suggesting that progress had, that has been made is sufficient to justify prolongation of the talks. Dr. Heinen, are you hearing anything different from Vienna these days? No, not in Vienna, not in Europe. I think that there is some but pessimism in air. I was in Europe last week and visited actually London, Paris, Brussels and Copenhagen and Berlin. And I more or less agree with what Ray said. That I don't think there will be a leap forward next Monday, unfortunately. Is there any greater optimism at the table? No, I agree with Ray, I think, if anything, and with Representative Deutsch. I mean, I think it's it's possible, and, and uh, administration uh, officials speaking on background have speculated about this, that you could see some kind of framework agreement that would outline parameters of what might uh, be a comprehensive uh, deal, but um, I think uh, members of the administration have also been very clearly trying to um, dampen expectations that we're going to actually have a, a full comprehensive agreement. And if press reports can be believed, which is a, 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 an interesting epistemological question, um, the, um, the big sticking point, or one of the big sticking points right now, is the uh, amount um, and, um, uh, and speed and sequencing of uh, sanctions relief. So on this, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, did you want to jump? I, I would just add to this. I mean, I, I think there is reason to be optimistic if you're Iran. And, <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that I actually think it plays to Iran's negotiating advantage for there to be some kind of parameters of framework agreement. Because if there is, they'll hook the fish. And what I mean by that is that they'll get our negotiators to lean forward to commit and make it very, actually very difficult for Western negotiators to then walk away. At the point that they've hooked the fish and they've got an agreement on parameters with details to be determined, by the way, it's, um, you know, the, the, the nuclear devil lies in those details. And so once they've actually got our negotiators committed, I think that they'll then grind our negotiators down on the details. So I think that there's a great risk, actually, in this parameters agreement in undercutting Western negotiating leverage. And, you know, I would prefer to see something relating to broad principles about how things are going to be handled as opposed to a commitment, a detailed parameters framework that overly commits our negotiators and gets them into a cycle where they will be forced to give up more and more concessions because they have, they've, they've been hooked. So on this question of, of U.S. leverage in these negotiations and at this particular point in time, um, is it really true, Mark, as, as you said, that you know, it doesn't seem like we have a lot of leverage? I mean, the price of oil is going down, which has to be hurting the, 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 the Iranians. We have a Republican con Senate coming in, in in January, which has to be a, a bit of a concern for the Iranians. Uh, I mean, maybe does, doesn't this feel like maybe a, a good time for them to to sign on the dotted line? Well, I, I think with respect to leverage, I mean, as, as Congressman Deutsch put it, you know, U, U.S. negotiating leverage has really come from these sanctions. I, I don't think Ali Khamenei fears a U.S. military strike either against Iranian nuclear facilities or against his ally Assad in Syria. So I, I think we're effectively left with economic leverage. And the reality of economic leverage, you know, shouldn't be measured by how much cash Iran got. It should be measured by where Iran was a year and a half ago before the Geneva process 
and before the joint plan of action and where they are today. And, and the statistics, statistics are, you know, are, are, are evident. And they're overwhelming. So the Iranian economy was on its back last year. It lost 6.5% in GDP. Inflation officially was at 40%. Unofficially, it was double that. The real had cratered, lost about 75% of its value. Iran was facing a balance of payments crisis. Iran was in a severe, deep recession. A year and a half later, the Iranian economy is projected to grow by 2%. Inflation is down to 14%. So essentially cut um, from 40 to 14%. And the real has stabilized. Iran is no longer facing a balance of payments crisis. Now, by all accounts, the Iranian economy is not doing well, but it's all the delta. It's the delta between where they are today and where they were a year ago, a year and a half ago. And it's a result of the de-escalation of sanctions pressure, the sanctions relief given as part of Geneva, the, the blocking of, of congressional sanctions and waiting, which would have created a sort of Damocles over the Iranian economy. And it's about a change in psychology, because sanctions are about psychology, not just legalities. And as a result, I think Iranian economic leverage has increased. They're no longer fearing a severe recession. They're no longer feeling about, fearing a balance of payments crisis. And I think we're in a position now where, as a result, they don't feel under acute pressure to actually make serious concessions, which is why I think the Iranians are quite happy to hold the line. The Supreme Leader has laid out the red lines, and their nuclear intransigence is, has increased, not decreased. Ray, would you agree with that assessment of the view from Tehran? I would add to it uh, the, the, the regional disorder that, that, that's sweeping the Middle East, uh, the rise of ISIS, and, and areas where I think the Iranians may perceive that their assistance is required for stabilization of Iraq, for fending off ISIS, and that gives you some sort of an implicit leverage over the negotiations. Uh, and when in September, when uh, President Rouhani was here, he suggested that nuclear concessions by the West could provoke Iranian assistance on ISIL. And the president, in his letter to Ali, to the Supreme Leader, made a similar case, namely that you know future is bright if the two come to an agreement on the nuclear issue, they can call, collaborate on a lot of regional affairs. So I think the disorder sweeping the region and the perception of, America, of Iranian assistance kind of adds an implicit leverage in the room. I mean, it's part, probably not part of the negotiations, but it sort of hangs, or hangs over the negotiations. And if you're kind of the Iranian leadership today, you, you feel a little comfortable. Uh, you know, you kind of in a region where, you know, you can navigate this disorder better than the Western powers. Your assistance may be required. The economic situation that Mark has talked about. And also, I would add one thing. Uh, uh, the sort of Iranian hardliners and uh, Supreme Leader certainly do have an economic vision uh, as a plan B. It's, it's called poverty, uh, national poverty. Uh, so they, they, the notion that you know, they, they, they will be making the type of concessions for the sort of leverage that we talked about. It is, is, is affects some aspects of the body politic, but the, not the entire aspect. So they're, they're walking into these negotiations for the reasons that Mark suggested and what has happened in the region with at least a perception that they're comfortable and they may not necessarily need to make the type of concessions that is required of them. You know, but the other thing, Blaze, I think, is to think about the negotiation in terms of how it looks from the point of view of Iranian negotiators who've been involved in this for a long time, as President Rouhani has, and Ray actually I think is one of the few people who's actually read President Rouhani's. And, and uh, oh yeah, I saw Ruel walk in. He's done. He's done it too. Read uh, the memoirs of um, President Rouhani um, and the discussion about the earlier negotiations. But if you think back. Uh, 10, 11 years, which we tend not to do in this town because everything's about what happened five minutes ago, but um, and where this all started with the, before it became the P5 plus one and it was the EU3 negotiating with Iran. I mean, you know, there's been kind of a serial retreat of red lines 
that have been established. The, you know, first they weren't supposed to put yellow cake, you know, into the um, Isfahan uranium conversion facility and turn it into gas. Then they weren't put, supposed to put gas into centrifuges, and they weren't supposed to spin centrifuges, and they were only supposed to have a few hundred centrifuges. Now, if you read, um, you know, uh, Under Secretary Sherman's uh, speech of uh, about I don't know week, 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 ten days ago. Um, you know, the U.S. team is talking about the you know acrobatics that they're doing diplomatically to try and come up with a variety of different um, conciliatory measures on numbers, you know, on plugging or unplugging centrifuges in order to uh, you know meet Iranian desiderata, which is that they want an industrial scale enrichment program. So if you look at this from you know a ten year kind of point of reference, uh, everything's moving your way, you know, uh, and you've given up really rather little in the course of these negotiations. Um, and w why would making more concessions now, um, you know, get you to a deal? I mean, you have every reason to believe that the harder a line you take, uh, the more you're likely to get from the other side. Can I just make one very brief point? I don't mean to sort of consume time. Uh, on that particular point that Eric made, I think one of the assumptions of U.S. administrations uh, has been that if you offer Iran concessions on some issues, and there was a piece in the New York Times about three, four days ago where an unnamed administration official said, you know what, Iranians are looking for a narrative of success. So they can go back to the public and say, we got the right to enrich. And if you give them these symbols of success, they will settle for a symbolic program. If you kind of listen to what the Iranians are saying, and Ali Shamkhani, who's emerged as a more of a public figure, he was always an important figure, gave an interview in which he talked about President Obama's letter to Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. And he's contrary to, I think, what's been reported in the Western press, most of the latter, he said, was about the nuclear issue, not ISIS. And he said, in our way, we responded, saying that we want an industrial-sized program. And that's not a secret. Iranians have all along said they want an industrial-sized program. So we are in a kind of an unusually bad position because we made all those symbolic concessions, which are quite important, the right to enrich in order to get Iran to be satisfied with a rudimentary program. And what they have done is accept those symbolic concessions, like the right to enrich, and insist on industrial size program. So in that sense, we kind of misread one important aspect of Iran's approach to its nuclear portfolio. They don't want a limited program, but an industrial size program. And the question is, how do you get there? Blaze, if I could just add to, to Eric and Ray's comments, I mean, actually, Eric, you don't even have to go back 10 years to, to see how we've retreated on nuclear red lines. You only have to go back a few months. It was actually November of last year where, where Secretary Kerry talked about dismantling Iran's program. Under Secretary Sherman talked about dismantling a lot of Iran's nuclear program. Then Press Secretary Jay Carney said in January, we're going to dismantle substantial portions of Iran's nuclear program. So, we, you know, we've gone from dis dismantle and, uh, and disclose in terms of PMDs to now, you know, disconnect, defer, and deter. And we've done that in eight months, and that's, that, that's, that's pretty rapid. Um, I would also say, Ray, that, I mean, Ray, Ray's exactly right, but in fact, as part of the JPOA, not only did we give up the so-called right to enrichment as an upfront concession, we gave up a number of other concessions up front. For example, we uh, acknowledge that this deal would be of limited duration. Ray has, has talked about this for months, that there's going to be a sunset provision, after which most of the constraints on Iran's nuclear program are going to go away, and Iran will be normalized under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. In other words, it will be treated no differently than Japan, Holland, or Germany, and be well positioned to have an industrial-sized nuclear program with an easier clandestine nuclear breakout. So we gave that up up front. Ballistic missiles have been taken off the table. If you heard Under Secretary Sherman's testimony a few months ago to the House Foreign Affairs Committee, she acknowledged that we, we, we're not going to stop Iran's long-range ballistic missile program. We're going to satisfy UN Security Council resolutions by dealing with the warhead, not the delivery vehicle. And yet the Defense Science Board came out in a report in January and said the United States has a terrible track record of nuclear detection and particularly bad at detecting warheads. Because, again, it's much easier to detect enrichment or plutonium 
uh, enrichment and, and reprocessing than it is to detect where warhead design is taking place. So we gave that up. Um, so we've given up a number of concessions up front. The Iranians have pocketed it. In response, they've been looking for more Western flexibility. Dr. Heinen, Mark mentioned some of the, the issues that are already listed in the, in the joint plan of action as being part of the final deal. The, the, the fact that there will be some form of enrichment, that the deal will have uh, a limited time duration. Um, so if, we're, if, if that's already some framework for a comprehensive agreement, uh, what sort of additional building on to that framework could we see on Monday? Or how would it be different than the framework that's already part of the JPA? Uh, this is difficult to, to really to envision what will be there. And I think that Congressman uh, Deutsch presented this case in very, very well in the beginning when, when he said that why we have the concerns about the Iran's nuclear program, the scope and content. And it's to do with the centrifuges, it's to do with the nuclear material, and it's to do with the, this military dimension. They are unseparated triplets. You cannot deal with one and leave the others out because they, there are these interconnections. And it's important, whatever is there in the framework, that all those things are, are addressed in a verifiable manner in the future. Then in addition to that, when I look at it, this is little like a blind date. It can be a very pleasant uh, 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 agreement, but it can also turn very disappointed evening, like it happens with the blind date sometimes. And why I say it, because there Never are Never so to you, I'm sure, Dr. Heinen. <laughs> you know, there are so many unknowns here. So we know that there are 19,000 centrifuges spin, ready to spin in Natanz and uh, in Fordow. But the question is, are these all the centrifuges in Iran? So if you go to agree, let's say that it's 4,000, which kind of assurances you have that there is not another 4,000 much better centrifuges somewhere else? So this needs to be baked into this system from the very beginning. And similarly, there needs to be provisions also for nuclear material. IAEA has verified that there is a little bit more than eight tons of low-end uranium, which hopefully gets at least most of it shipped away. But is this all uranium in Iran? IAEA has not yet been permitted to do that part of the work. So it needs to be also in these parameters and in, in the agreement on Monday. And then the third one is the uh, possible uh, military dimension. As Congressman said, this is why the sanctions were in the first place put in place. So you cannot brush that away and address that later. And why that is important is that this actually sets the parameters for the, how many centrifuges you may let them have there because you want to know that whether they are screwdriver turn away from nuclear weapon capability or is there a lot of experimentation which needs to be done. And then you can establish on one hand what kind of nuclear material inventory stays and then you can select certain points for monitoring so that you will see if this program is reconstituted uh, uh, after 2003 and those experiments which probably are still going. So these are the vital things which in my view needs to be on this to make it success. But uh, so on this triplet of issues, which right, the, the three elements of a nuclear weapon are the fissile material, turning that fissile material into an explosive, and then putting it in a delivery device, so a ballistic missile. Are all three of those elements part of the negotiations that are currently going on? Because PMD seems to be being pursued by the IAEA on a separate track. We heard that ballistic missiles maybe have been put, put, put off the table. In my view, they have to be there because they are part of the UN Security Council resolution. <laughs> the resolution says, among other things, that all lo long outstanding issues with the IAEA need to be resolved. So you cannot change that, that sentence unless you make a new resolution by the Security Council, but this is not important. So I think that it needs to be addressed that in a front end and not in the back end in order to have, the, to have a credible agreement. And here is a lesson to be learned from North Korea. If you look which where the deficit is uh, with the agreed framework, this was exactly that part which was not under control at all. Blaze, you know, <clears throat> Mr. Deutsch, I think, said something um, important here, which was that, it, you know, the members of the Congress are going to look very closely, obviously, at whatever, at the details of whatever does come out on Monday, if uh, assuming anything beyond an extension comes out. And here, I think, you know, the administration has been suggesting 
that on the question of all the concessions that Ray and, and Mark and I and, and Ali have been talking about, that they've traded uh, some of these elements of the Iranian program in exchange for greater transparency, and that that's going to be kind of the sine qua non against which the agreement uh, will be measured. I mean, uh, both Secretary Kerry and Wendy Sherman have said repeatedly that a, a bad agreement is worse than no agreement. Uh, so the question really is going to turn on, well, what's your definition, you know, of a, of a bad agreement? You know, from my point of view, any agreement that allows Iran to do any enrichment is a bad agreement. And that's not just my view. If you talk to any of the uh, Gulf Arab states, including uh, the UAE, which has signed a one two three agreement, uh, which uses the gold standard, no enrichment, no reprocessing. Um, any agreement that allows Iran to enrich is going to look like a bad agreement from their point of view. So if you're using, you know, the, the um, transparency as a measure of what is a good or bad agreement, unless the PMD issues are resolved, I don't think, and I'm interested in Ollie's view on this, but I don't think it's possible to be able to judge whether you have a verification regime in which you can repose very much confidence unless that, I think that's what you were saying, unless those PMD issues are actually uh, illuminated and, and resolved. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, Secretary Kerry said he's been very explicit about the four paths and other administration spokespeople have been talking about the four paths, one of which includes the covert path to a... Uh, um, to a bomb. That's the sort of uh, what my former boss, Don Rumsfeld, used to call the unknown unknowns. Um, and again, I mean, unless the PMD piece is resolved, uh, I mean, I think, frankly, it's hard to have confidence in your, that you've closed that door no matter what. But uh, at a minimum, unless you've got PMD uh, under your belt, and I would argue ballistic missiles as well, uh, I don't know how you can close that door. But what's interesting, Eric, is even if we assume that we get a, a gold standard verification and inspection regime. So let's assume for the sake of argument that we, we get it and we get some resolution on PMDs. The, the question then becomes, it's a famous foreign affairs piece many years ago, after detection what? Question mark. So after we detect that the Iranians are in non-compliance, so what do we do? Well, I think the track record of the Iranian nuclear program suggests that when the Iranian regime cheats, it cheats incrementally. It doesn't cheat um, in a egregious way. The sum total of its incremental cheating is egregious, but the way it cheats is incrementally. So we can assume that if Iran falls out of compliance with its obligations and we detect that, the violation will be incremental. And then the question is, how do we respond? Well, we could demarche them. And as, as somebody once told me, it, it's not a demarche, it's a demarche mellow. <laughs> Right, so it has has clearly no no impact. Uh, we can threaten to bomb them every time there is an incremental violation, but but that's ridiculous because the fact that the Iranians are not letting weapons inspectors into a, a military base, or the fact that we've detected a small amount of enriched uranium that's fallen off the back of the centrifuge, or the thousands of other incremental examples of violations, is not going to prompt any president of the United States to order military strikes against Iran's nuclear facility. So what are we left with in terms of leverage? Well, I would argue we're left only with economic leverage. We only have the ability to use economic power to force the Iranians back into compliance. And then the question becomes, well, have we retained sufficient economic leverage to do so? Or, as Congressman Deutsch said, are we finding ourselves in a situation where companies are streaming back into Iran, billions of dollars of investment are going back into Iran. There's been a fundamental shift in, the, in psychology, and so the Iranian economy is now on a more durable recovery path, and therefore they, they are actually beginning to protect themselves against further economic sanctions. And so we may find ourselves with sanctions unwinding, either in law or in fact, we may find the European oil embargo having gone down, Iranian banks back on SWIFT, and we may be in a situation where now we don't have the economic leverage to force them back into compliance. So some folks will say, and I'll end with this, it's okay, we'll snap back the sanctions. They'll all just snap back. Now that's probably true in law. We could snap back the sanctions in law. 
But again, sanctions are not about legalities. They're about politics. They're about psychology. They're about economics. They're about market realities. And the idea that we can snap back the sanctions and get all of these companies that have gone back into Iran now back out, I think is uh, deeply problematic, which is why Congress needs to defend the very sanctions architecture it built against any concerns or any possibility of the administration precipitously unwinding this or the Security Council unwinding this or the Europeans unwinding this. It's going to be absolutely critical to maintain a sanctions architecture as an enforcement tool to back up any verification and inspection regime. I just want to make a point, a political point, about um, what Mark just said about detection and um, and enforcement. Um, Congressman Deutsch said in his remarks uh, that you know he believes that the Congress ought to, um, if there's uh, no agreement on the 24th, you know, impose or pass sanctions that would be imposed if Iran um, were to be found violating, among other things, the agreement or to break out of the agreement. Um, it's interesting, I think, that. Uh, we have a little example of precisely what uh, Mark was talking about, this sort of um, you know, propensity to, you know, uh, walk up to the line and test the, you know, test the limits of agreement on the part of the Iranians uh, in the last IAEA report. Um, because arguably the Iranians are already in violation of the, of the joint plan of action. What's very interesting to me is that in the past, since last November, when the agreement was uh, first reached, uh, the IEA has done a number of reports and each time has uh, found the uh, Iranians to be complying with the joint plan of action. And the administration has, has trumpeted those reports um, and thrown them in the face of critics like, like me um, and said, see, they're abiding by it. Uh, since the November 7th um, publication of the last IEA report, which shows that uh, the Iranians have uh, fed UF-6 into their IR-5 centrifuges um, and that they have not um, uh, turned all of the LEU that they've produced um, into um, oxide, um, the uh, administration has been silent. Not a word. Now, if you know if, uh, administration folks were here, they'd probably say, "Well, yes, we're going to address that privately with the Iranians." But it's it's just interesting that nobody has publicly said this, and I think it's because nobody wants to talk about the fact that already, before you know, we've even gotten to the comprehensive agreement, the interim agreement's already being tested and challenged by the Iranians. Is that a fair assessment, Dr. Reinen? Is, is is that what we learned from the last IEA report? That is, that is true, unfortunately. I think that Iran is testing here the limits at what will be the response when they don't follow exactly the letter and spirit of that agreement of, of a year ago. And uh, today will be, by the way, the next progress report of IAEA coming out, so maybe it's already out. So it will be interesting to see how these numbers are there and what the IAEA will say about the implementation of JPOA. So maybe before launching into the issue that, that Mark raised of, of sort of Congress's role and, 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 and sanction, structure of sanctions relief for keeping sanctions, maybe we can go to a little more foundational question, which is something that Representative Deutsch raised and, and has been mentioned at the table here today, which is that this mantra that, that, that a bad deal is worse than no deal. Um, why is that? I guess. What, 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 what is the reasoning behind that? Well, Blaise, let me just raise one other point, and I think it's connected to this. And, and you know, so who cares that the Iranians are feeding UF-6 into an IR-5? It's like how many Iranian screws can dance on the, on the head of a centrifuge? I mean, these are such obscure technical questions, aren't they? But they're not. They're, they're critical questions. I mean, why is it important that Iran is testing advanced centrifuges? It's important because, as, as many of you know, that the more advanced the centrifuge is, the more efficient it is. The more efficient it is, the fewer number of centrifuges you need to achieve the same results. And if you have fewer number of centrifuges, they're easier to hide. And that's why the advanced centrifuge is so critical to Iran if Iran ever wants to have a clandestine breakout option. 
And so I was giving you a list of concessions that the Iranians pocketed up front as part of the JPOA. Well, this was another one. We actually allowed them to continue doing work on advanced centrifuges. Now, we capped them. We grandfathered in the IR2Ms. They weren't allowed to do, uh, they weren't allowed to actually feed UF6 into more advanced centrifuges, but they could do still R&D and technical work short of that with other advanced models. The fact of the matter is, is again, this is, in many respects, this could be one of the poison pills of a deal. If the Iranians are allowed to work on advanced centrifuges, even if it's capped at a certain level, they are, they are creating the necessary infrastructure for that industrial size program and that easier clandestine breakout. And so that's why it's really important that we know the difference between a good and a bad deal and we don't get obscured by the technical details because the Iranians are not. You know, Rouhani and Zarif know this file really well. They've written books on it. They were negotiating in 2003, 2005. Um, they've probably forgotten nuclear tricks that, that certainly I've never learned. Um, I know Ollie's learned all of them. Um, and I wish Ollie was in Vienna right now. But, th but the reality is, is that it is incredibly important for Congress to understand not only these technical details, but understand how the Iranians are red teaming all of our proposals. Because they're red teaming everything. You know, when we talk about disconnect and disable, they are red teaming it. When we talk about taking 14,000 centrifuges out of Natanz and putting them in, in a warehouse under safe guards and telling everybody that that will take a year to reinstall and reconnect those IR-1 centrifuges, the Iranians are red teaming in that because the Iranians are never going to reinstall and reconnect the old centrifuges. They're going to take the advanced centrifuges, right? They need fewer number of centrifuges to achieve the same result, and they're going to install and connect those. And so instead of taking a year to do that, it'll take a couple of months to do that, as, as Ali has written recently. So they, they are masters of the workaround, whether it's in nuclear physics or in sanctions evasion. They are the masters of red teaming and the masters of the workaround, and we need to understand that when we evaluate any deal. Tell us how many SWU can dance on the head of a centrifuge. <laughs> no. uh, actually, I want to bring to your attention another aspect. Let's not forget that Iran is in non-compliance with its safeguards agreement, and it's in non-compliance with the Security Council resolutions. So when, whether there is a bad deal or good deal, actually we are rewarding a country from bad behavior. And this will have tremendous implications to the no nuclear non-proliferation, not only in the Middle East, but also in Far East, North East Asia with the North Korea. This is a playbook for the future proliferators. If you are stubborn enough, you get away with that. And where is then the authority of the UN Security Council? Where is the authority of the IAEA? You erode that at the same time, and they are the only arms and, you know, eyes which the international community has in right. this. So there are a lot of other things in the stake which get forgotten in this discussion. Right. On that point, I uh, think we're going to adjourn our panel and return to our seats and clear the table for Senator Kirk uh, and Chris Griffin, the Executive Director of the Foreign Policy Initiative, who will moderate a discussion with, with this team senator. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Griffin. I'm the executive director at the Foreign Policy Initiative. Um, uh, of course, Senator Kirk is, is very well known to this audience, and it's an incredible pleasure that he would join us again today um, to, to briefly re reintroduce the senator. 
Uh, Senator Mark Kirk uh, served in the House of Representatives for five terms before being elected to the Senate in 2010. Uh, he is a leader on national security issues uh, and the author or co-author of many of the most important bills pertaining to Iran's uh, nuclear program and targeting Iran's uh, illicit financial activities. Um, would, of course, particularly want to note uh, the Nuclear Weapons Free <laughs> Iran Act, uh, which is commonly known as the uh, Menendez-Kirk Bill, uh, and in that titling uh, speaks to the uh, bipartisan nature of Senator Kirk's leadership on these issues. It does help to call it Menendez-Kirk to get Democrats on board. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, the Foreign Policy Initiative, uh, uh, and everyone who joined us here today to hear your remarks. Um, thank you for sharing your valuable time with us uh, on this most important of issues. Thank you. Uh, to start the conversation, we would like to pose to you the same question that uh, Blaze started uh, to the, the, the broader conversation with our panelists on, um, which is uh, what are the prospects that you see for a, a final comprehensive solution uh, to uh, Iran's uh, nuclear program as proposed in the Joint Program of Action, uh, as we see the deadline coming up on November 24th, uh, or alternatively, uh, some kind of extension of the JPA, or alternatively, some kind of framework agreement. That, that w What are you expecting to see as we approach this coming deadline? I'm actually not expecting to see a successful agreement. I think uh, as long as the nuclear program exists in Iran, Congress should adopt the Menendez-Kirk sanctions to uh, enable uh, a framework of a declining Iranian economy that would improve the chances of a true, true uh, monitoring of uh, whatever commitments that the, Ira the Iranians will just lie their faces off to get a bomb. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I, I suppose, and you, you mentioned, of course, the bill that you and Senator Menendez have offered, uh, and uh, see that, that you brought uh, a distinction between uh, South Africa and how it dismantled its nuclear program in the discussion with Iran, um, you know, that the one, perhaps, advantage that could come for Congress, for the United States, and our partners, if there's some type of extension, uh, is the opportunity to describe what the conditions would be for a successful dismantlement of the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, would be grateful if you could speak to that distinction, or, or what would you see as the key? You know, we have items. seen with South Africa, when a country really doesn't want to give up nukes, uh, how it can be done. I think for uh, members of Congress, if it's good enough for Nelson Mandela, it's good enough for them. Uh, that, that's a, uh, a high bar and an important one to set. Um, yeah. that, that you have... Um, pointed out uh, some of the uh, negotiating positions that the United States has taken, uh, that the distinction uh, between what was once dismantlement is the requirement for the Iranian nuclear program uh, to what's often described as dis Let me uh, take a direction. Please. The main goal I have here is to make sure we protect the next generation of Americans from witnessing a nuclear war in the Middle East. We, President Obama should not uh, voice that off on their future successor. That is such a horrible uh, future to condemn young Americans to. I would say uh, once nukes start flying between Riyadh and, uh, and uh, Tehran, uh, we should not have Americans uh, witness that. That has been my goal, to make sure that future does not come about. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the, the role of Congress, um, both the specific legislation uh, that you've offered so far, uh, and uh, as you, of course, know, uh, administration officials um, have said to the press uh, that if, if an agreement is reached with Iran, uh, that, quote, the president will do everything in his power to avoid letting Congress vote on such an agreement. Um, in contrast, uh, I, I believe, according to press reports, uh, you today with a large number of your colleagues, some 42 members of your colleagues, sent a, a letter to the president. And, and if you'll allow me to, to briefly quote... It's easy. Uh, every, every Republican senator signed that letter. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Which is indicative because we're about to be the majority here. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and do you believe that any agreement um, could hold without congressional approval? It can't. If you just go it alone, you're, 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 if the president just goes it alone, he can't get, uh, if, he, uh, if, if he's looking for bipartisan support, if you just go it along, alone, you're going to get no partisan support. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, to, reaching back to the bipartisan leadership you've shown working with Senator Menendez, do, do you believe that that's a position that holds across the aisle? I have 17 Democrats on board with me, yes, sir. including uh, such leading lights like uh, Bob Menendez and Chuck Schumer. Yes, sir. Um, to move on to uh, a, a separate topic, um, that, that you speak to the idea of the, the danger that if somehow Iran's allowed to become a, a nuclear state or a threshold nuclear state of additional proliferation, um, yeah, in contrast to that nightmare scenario, some of the phrases that we've seen reported recently in the press include the prospect of a, a detente with Iran, what's been proposed as a Persian pivot to Let me Iran. take on that detente with Iran. Uh, we have uh, heard a lot of uh, hogwash from the administration about uh, working with Iran to uh, control ISIS. That's like hiring the arsonist to, to, uh, to uh, join the fire department. Yeah. <laughs> uh, succinctly and, and accurately stated, um, of course, I I Iran's uh, ongoing human rights abuses uh, that at this point conducting executions. I'm glad you raised uh, that. Uh, I have uh, been focusing pretty heavily on the Iranian human rights with the uh, individual uh, uh, IDAP program, getting individual uh, legislators to uh, adopt Iranian dissidents. Uh, and, and do you see any uh, prospect for that moving forward, either in this Congress? We, or we've, had, we've had some uh, uh, success. I, I strongly adopted the case of uh, Nasr Institute, a lovely uh, mother of two, who was a human rights lawyer, who was thrown in the uh, the uh, you know, infamous uh, Evan Pitt prison, mm. away from her two kids, and just before. Uh, the Iranian president came to the UN General Assembly. He released her because I was organizing to have Nasr Institute uh, posters all over New York, and uh, he didn't want to. He wanted to have taken care of that problem. So I would say that external pressure and individual cases can work. Yes. Yeah. Um, in, in your to, to speak more narrowly back on uh, the negotiations again. Uh, in your poster, you, you point out that it took 17 years for South Africa to get to uh, where it had completely eliminated uh, a prospective nuclear threat. Um, you know, one of the major criticisms that, that you uh, have offered, and certainly many others across the aisle have offered, of the Joint Program of Action is the so-called Sunset Clause, that, that any deal with Iran uh, could eventually expire and Iran would be treated like a normal nuclear state. Um, that In the letter that you sent today that, that you, you, are, sorry, you speak to uh, having a verification regime uh, for decades, um, how important an issue is that, that, that any approach with Iran speaks to a really long-term solution? My guess is, uh, you know, remember the uh, uh, Syrian reactor? I remember when Israel uh, wiped it out. We had a, uh, the first press release that we saw came from uh, North Korea. It shows that all these uh, terrorists are, are uh, connected, that I think, we have to assume the Iranian bomb is also related to the PAC bomb or a North Korean design. And there's a lot of interchange between uh, rogue uh, nuclear wannabe states. And I suppose that interaction among rogue states you know, brings up you know, a final you know, fundamental question is the prospect of unknowns whenever we look at Iran's program, uh, its cooperation with other regimes, and, and some of the areas that either have really dropped out of uh, the focus of the negotiations right now, like the missile program, and, and questions that the IAEA just hasn't been able to answer yet in terms of uh, how many centrifuges does Iran actually have that it hasn't declared? Is there any additional nuclear materials that it hasn't declared? Um, that a, as you look at the prospect of those unknowns, uh, you know, what do you see as the key priorities for these negotiations and Cong Congress's response? I, I, you know, we were just falling over laughing the other day when the administration said, hey, how about an agreement in which the Iranians promised to disconnect the Cascades? And uh, that got a huge laugh in the uh, Republican conference. <laughs> yeah. uh, the comedy is not the intended effect of these negotiations. And, they, they should be on Leno. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tragedy when that's the consequence. Um, 
in in terms of the the prospects for moving forward next year, um, when, when you initially drafted uh, your legislation with Senator Menendez, it was at the very beginning of the Joint Program of Action, uh, either looking to an extension or some type of framework. What would you see as the key areas for Congress to focus on going next? The key areas are uh, to always keep your eye on the prize. Uh, and the question is always going to be, does Iran have the bomb? In the case of Iran getting the bomb, I've always assumed that the uh, roughly 200 weapons that are in Pakistan now were uh, rent bombs for uh, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> that the moment Saudi uh, sees that uh, the Iranians have the bomb, they'll... Uh, Call in there. They'll they'll use their Hertz uh, preferred uh, credit uh, thing to uh, get a couple of bombs sent over. Right. Um, uh, they definitely uh, uh, that the nightmare and tragically seems so likely if we go down that path scenario of additional prospe- uh, additional proliferation in the Middle East. Um, yeah, as a final question uh, for the day, that that w- would. As you look forward to next Monday uh, and what you expect, that what will you be judging the next steps of the administration by, and do you see any steps they can take that could develop greater congressional support? Releasing the text of the agreement, uh, I think Wendy Sherman, who is the chief negotiating here, has uh, tried to keep the agreement uh, secret because she doesn't want someone like me, a uh, member who will read every sentence and say, uh, does that work? Does that work? Does that work? She doesn't want a rigorous, uh, it's kind of like Jonathan Gruber, uh, where a lack of transparency helps to get this through. Right. I think we, we need the whole agreement out there so that Congress can read it and go over it. I suppose that brings to mind you know, the idea that you have to, to sign a deal to see what's in a deal. Uh, that, you know, one thing that we found last year was that you know, it, the, the, in executing the JPA, that the idea that Iran could continue centrifuge research wasn't evident on day one, became evident a couple of months into it. Uh, I, I assume that's something that you'll be following very closely. Um, uh, Senator, unless you have any additional points to, to offer, I want to thank you. I will Please. add one other point. Uh, a lot of times when we get into the technical details of a nuclear arms with uh, senators, they don't really get it very quickly. Uh, at one point, Wendy was briefing us uh, about mixing non-fissile material with a fissile material. Mm-hmm. And I uh, popped and I said to the senators, I said, Wendy, if uh, they have a bunch of... Uh, Highly enriched uranium, and they mix it with M and M's. Don't you think they're going to go through and pick out the M and M's as a way to uh, have the concept of uh, repurifying uh, the uh, the enriched material, so the senators would understand probably what the Iranians would do. Right. Um, a, a, a certainly a challenging time, Senator. We we thank you for your leadership during these times, uh, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to to share your views on these negotiations and the challenges we face with us. You. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm great. We'll invite plays to return to the podium with our panelists, and thank you so much. Senator Kirk, thank you again for your comments. Chris, thank you for for moderating. Please give us a second while we recollect ourselves. Ray, you have to stand. <laughs> so maybe we can do one quick discussion of, of the senator's comments before turning it over to the audience for, for, for questions for our panel. Um, 
but but on this line of questioning that that, that Chris asked the senator about um, the administration seeming willing desire to keep uh, any deal away from from congressional consideration, um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on 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 why that might be, and also what what you see as the proper role Congress should play uh, in the negotiations going forward, and especially if there is a comprehensive deal four days from today. I can start because. Eric, uh, Dennis, and I wrote a piece about this, uh, so with the, uh, make references to to that piece. Uh, I, if you kind of look at the history of arms control, it's an impractical approach. Uh, if you don't, I mean, I hear these arguments. Let's get an agreement before January the third. You know, sneak Sally through the alley and all that. Uh, I mean, you know, the administration would be wise if it wants to have a durable agreement to get a congressional buy-in. Uh, otherwise, I think this is a very thin rail uh, for an agreement to be this level of controversy and secrecy surrounding it. Uh, it just, it, it really goes to a question of his durability, which is why I think Eric and I and Dennis wrote the piece, because we were suggesting that if you want to have a durable arms control agreement, you're going to have to have some sort of a domestic consensus, congressional, uh, legislative branch, and, and executive. Uh, I do think that as much as possible, the two branches of government should stay together. Uh, I, I think a presidential veto on congressional measure will be devastating for both parties. It'll erode the credibility of the Hill, certainly, but it'll also demonstrate to many that the only way an arms control agreement is in place is through procedural manipulation. Uh, and by having a greater degree of agreement between legislative and executive branch, you have to take some of the imperatives of legislative branch into consideration. Uh, so I think moving forward, what I see is a consensus regime in Iran, a lot of division in this country and division between five plus one, potentially. And I think the task at hand is to essentially bridge those gaps to the extent possible. See, I'm, I'm, I'm a uniter, not a divider. I'm just going to bring people together. Uh, that's what I'm known for. Uh, but that that's uh, transparency and uh, consultancy is, is an aspect of that. So, so Blaze, I would just add to raise comments on the sanction side. I mean, I, I mentioned to Congressman Deutsch that um, it underscored this letter. It was a July 2014 letter. It's, this is a really critical letter. 344 members of the House affirmed that the concept of an exclusively defined nuclear-related sanction on Iran does not exist in U.S. law, quote-unquote. There are no nuclear sanctions. And if you do an analysis of the sanctions that have been imposed against the Islamic Republic of Iran, they are hybrid sanctions. They are sanctions that are based on the, a range of Iran's illicit conduct. The Central Bank of Iran was not designated only because of Iran's nuclear program. It was designated on the basis of, of a Section 311 finding under the Patriot Act, which was an administration finding, a treasury finding, that explicitly references the Central Bank's role in a range of illicit activities, including terror financing, proliferation-sensitive financing, money laundering, and evasive financial con conduct. You know, there is no such thing as a good Iranian bank today. All of those banks represent a significant threat to the global financial community. That's not me saying that. That's Under Secretary Cohen saying that. That's Secretary Liu saying that. That's former Under Secretary Stuart Levy saying that. That's the administration that's been saying that in the Bush administration and in the Obama administration. So these sanctions are not nuclear sanctions, and the notion that somehow the president is going to be able to use waivers and special rules and blocking special investigations and the lack of enforcement and a number of other executive branch tricks to waive sanctions against Iran, I think is going to be met with significant backlash from Congress who, as Congressman Deutsch said, put in place many of those sanctions. So I think it would be wise for the administration to engage with Congress in a structured way and to figure out a s program of smart sanctions defense, enforcement, and relief. And so that this could be done in a structured, effective way. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of conflict in Washington over sanctions relief, and the only beneficiary of that will be Iran, 
who ultimately will be in a position where they'll be able to cheat on any nuclear agreement without it worrying about American and Western economic leverage. I would end there. Uh, you know, not too much to add, really, um, particularly since Ray and I and Dennis have already been in print on the subject, as Ray mentioned. Um, I, I guess I would make an analogy here. Uh, I mean, the tech, there's a technical issue that, that Representative Deutsch and Mark uh, have both touched on, which is, as a matter of law, you know, if there's legislation on the books that has to be um, uh, overturned here, then the Congress needs to be involved, obviously. But there's a broader, I think, a political point to be made. And here there's, I think, an analogy to things that happen in the domestic arena. I think as a general rule of thumb, um, you know, major uh, legislation on the domestic side that is going to affect big swaths of, of the country, like civil rights or social security, are things that ought to be done by large bipartisan majorities. And that has been the tradition historically, actually, in the country. The same is true, actually, in the national security area. Major arms control agreements uh, under the treaty powers of the of the uh, Constitution and the Senate uh, are you know have to be ratified by a two thirds majority. Uh, every arms control agreement that we have that has passed has been by a, a large bipartisan uh, majority. Um, this is not going to be a treaty. This is going to be an executive um, agreement, uh, but it is a huge deal. It is, you know, one of the issues that the president at the outset of administration identified as one of the most important national security challenges facing the nation. Uh, and how could you treat it at some lesser level, in my view? Dr. Heinen, maybe last question on not U.S. sanctions, but U.N. Security Council sanctions, which are also part of the puzzle uh, that, that Iran will want to see uh, rolled back. How would that process have to look? Well... It depends actually on the Security Council, how they, hey, they plan to ha handle this and how P5 plus 1 want to handle it. But that would be a bit difficult because there are quite a lot of items uh, which ne still need to be resolved, like the long outstanding issues, which de facto means the PMD. Uh, and this is a must in this resolution. So you, I think at the Security Council, if they just wipe that away, they in a way shoot their own leg and say that actually we made a wrong decision a few years ago. So this is going to be a very complicated process. And then the sanctions have, or the resolutions have a long list of people who are on the sanctions list and companies. How to deal with all those, I think it's going to be difficult. And then I would like to say a couple of words about transparency. I think that uh, Senator Kirk raised an important thing. What is transparency? And this, it's so easy to throw to the discussion and say that, you know, okay, we, will, we don't make any legal arrangements, but uh, we, we will be transparent, so don't worry, be happy. And we go back to the Iranian dossier. In early 1990s, the first concerns started to come up about the clandestine program of Iran in terms of uh, having some enrichment-related activities in uh, Sharif University in Tehran and some military installations and uh, acquisition of nuclear material abroad. So Iranian ambassador at that time agreed with Hans Blix, the director general, that IAEA conducts uh, transparency visits to Iran. And so it happened. They went with a higher level two, three times, no, three, four times, found some discrepancies. But in reality, they went to the right places, but they were deceived. So that's about the transparency. And then the same thing happened in 2003, 2004 uh, on this undertaking with the EU3 Ira Iranians committed to transparency. And we saw the result. They had some clandestine activities they did disclosed the P2 program, they built an uh, installation in Fordow without reporting to the IAEA. So in my view, we should not use the word transparency here at all, or if we use it, it's not a voluntary undertaking, but it has to be legally binding and most likely in the UN Security Council resolution, which is also binding under the international law. With that, we have about half an hour for questions from the audience. And bearing in mind Dr. Heinen's call for transparency, I'd ask you to state your name and affiliation and be sure to, to ask a question. We have microphones going around. I see first question in the back here. Thank you. 
thank you. It's um, Dana Marshall with Transnational uh, Strategy Group. I want to thank the um, Mark and other colleagues for putting this timely event on. I wanted to explore with the panel a bit uh, another very important aspect, which is um, in the hands of, of those well outside the, um, the Beltway uh, and could arguably be seen as even more uh, important leverage that uh, the world has to prevent Iranian bombing. Of course, I'm speaking here about European uh, positions. Uh, I wonder if um, we could maybe look, peer ahead a few chess moves uh, about what might happen after next Monday. Uh, if there is, in particular, a view, uh, a different view on the other side of the Atlantic about how far this negotiation has come and the degree to which Iran uh, might have some sanctions relief uh, here compared to there. I think most of us understand that um, much of the effect of the sanctions has been because of the Europeans uh, cutting out what uh, would always traditionally have been much larger trade and investment. So I think it's important to look at what, uh, what our European partners are thinking. I wonder if the panel could help us think through different scenarios about where, whether Brussels and Washington continue to hold hands or may move in different directions. Dr. Heiden, I don't know, since you just returned from a grand European tour, if you want to start, and then, then Mark. Yes, and I had to take uh, as a European some blame as well, because I'm from Finland and it's part of the European Union. Uh, I'm not a sanctions specialist, so I leave it to Mark to address, but uh, we have to remember that the European Union consists of 28 states, and all the decisions are made practically based on consensus. And there are different views about these sanctions. And, but the whole system there in Europe is actually based on the UN Security Council resolutions. So they are key. If you start to change those, uh, or in order to change anything on the sanctions in Europe, you need to change the UN Security Council resolutions. That's the only thing I can say. And then some countries are looking definitely for trade in Iran, particularly the medium-sized industry, I understood last week, is very interested in making better relations and start to export Iran because of the difficulties in Europe. So it's going to be a very, very tough ride, you know, and discussions in the next two, three weeks in Europe. Mark? So, Dana, I mean, thank you for that question. And I think, as you know, um, these European sanctions are in place, I, I would argue, for two fundamental reasons. One is because um, the French in particular have played an, an instrumental role in driving these sanctions within the European Union. And as, as Ali mentioned, getting consensus from 28 members was, was very difficult. But I think the French played a, a very important role in making that happen, uh, particularly f former French President uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. Um, and I think that tradition has actually been continued under his uh, socialist successor, François Hollande. So I think the French remain uh, the linchpin of both the nuclear nonproliferation regime globally um, and feel that they are the, the safeguards uh, or the custodians of that nonproliferation regime, which I think gives them a, a very prominent role on the nuclear physics side of this. And I think within the European Union on the sanction side, they're, they're going to be key. But I think it's also worth um, reminding ourselves that it, it was because of U.S. leadership, particularly leadership from, uh, from Congress and from the administration, that the Europeans eventually went along with, with these sanctions. You know, those bills that were coming in 2010 and 11 and 12 and 13, I mean, those bills threatened secondary sanctions against international financial institutions, international energy companies, insurance companies, shippers, etc. They were doing business with Iran. And they put companies, including in Europe, to a fundamental choice between doing business with Iran or doing business with the United States. And particularly given the power of the U.S. dollar and the the uh, the role of, of New York in clearing U.S. dollar transactions, no European financial institution wanted to get on the wrong side, not only of Congress and, and the executive branch, but of the superintendent of financial institutions in New York, the key banking regulator, the Manhattan DA, and Southern District of New York, who actually led the way in many of these multi-billion dollar 
banking cases against uh, financial institutions that were, were evading sanctions. So there's no substitute for U.S. leadership. I, I think the French are going to play a key role. I do worry, as I said earlier, that if the Europeans suspend their oil embargo and that embargo goes down, I, I worry that the sanctions regime will go down and that we will be in a position where we will be loath to sanction European financial institutions and energy companies who are now participating in increased uh, energy and industrial trade with, with Iran. And again, that gets to my, my comment earlier. Without that leverage, we cannot enforce a deal. We cannot back up a verification and inspection regime. So I hope in European capitals today, they are thinking of ways to maintain leverage uh, rather than just thinking of ways to get back to business. Uh, I would just add to um, Ali and Mark's comments that um, although the EU uh, obviously operates by consensus and as a formal matter all governments are equal, some governments are more equal than others, um, and, and really I think the, um, the EU three who have been involved in these negotiations uh, are really the key drivers and actors here, and I very much agree with what Mark said. I was just speaking to some French colleagues yesterday. I, I think the French have been remarkably stalwart uh, throughout this process. Um, Ray and I have actually also been in print uh, commending the French for the role they've played in the face of a, a certain amount of criticism from the administration. Uh, I think that uh, the um, FRG has been actually uh, surprisingly uh, strong on this. And I'm sorry to say, I think the weak link has been our... our um, our cousins across the pond in the UK, uh, which I think has something to do with the role of the City of London um, in the international financial uh, world and concerns about the continued cost uh, to Britain of the sanctions. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think uh, we'll just have to see, Dana, where we are after Monday. I, I think a lot will depend on, you know, uh, how this. And, uh, you know, in, whether there's an extension or how long is it an extension, uh, have the Iranians begun to make any kind of concessions at all, or are they uh, being particularly obdurate um, in Vienna? I think absent understanding that, it's really hard to say how the transatlantic peace will play out. Ray, anything to add? Next question, right here. I'm Fred Flight with the Center for Security Policy. This has been a brilliant panel. I'm very grateful for having been invited. I have some blunt questions to ask you. you the panel's admitted that we have conceded to Iran the right to enrich uranium. We've seen reports over the last few weeks of allowing Iran to operate 1,500, 4,500, 6,000, and this week 8,000 uranium centrifuges. Iran has cheated on the interim agreement and has refused to comply uh, with cooperating with the IEA or allow access to uh, nuclear facilities. So I got to say to you, quite frankly, isn't this really a containment strategy? This is not a serious strategy to stop the Iranian nuclear program. The president is conceding the bomb to the Iranians, hoping to contain it. And if that's the case, and my center, the Center for Security Policy, we really believe it is, wouldn't a better strategy right now for Congress to repudiate these talks without reservation and call for the United States and its European allies to go back to the negotiating table, I mean back to the drawing board, and come up with a realistic strategy to roll back the, the Iranians' nuclear ambitions. That, that, more of a comment, I, I'll say a few things about it. Uh, I think if you're kind of looking at these negotiations and this issue, you have to keep in mind the international coalition and maintaining that for all the reasons that Mark suggested in terms of economic pressure. Uh, I mean, you are right to suggest that a certain set of assumptions have underwritten U.S. policy toward this issue for about 10, 15 years. And whether there's an extension or not, those assumptions should be reconsidered or reevaluated at least. Uh, the notion that we can secure a reasonable interlocutor through economic penalties uh, that's prone to adhere to an agreement in perpetuity. Uh, the notion that through, as I mentioned, symbolic concessions, you can get Iranians to forego industrialization of their program. I mean, we have made series of assumptions across a number of administrations. 
administrations. Uh, and I think those assumptions need to be taken into consideration. If there's an extension or not, people should go back to the table and say, all right, we operated based upon these categories of assumptions for over a decade. Now it's time to take stock of them. Uh, as far as an agreement, you know, any arms control agreement with a sort of a regime that's imbued with a certain ideology and conspiracy theories is, is going to have unreliabilities. Uh, and no inspection regime is likely to kind of be comprehensive enough to monitor the program. Uh, I mean, Eric made that point. Uh, I view the Iranian program as like my son's computer. I can regulate how he uses it or I can take it away from him. Uh, but we're no longer taking it away. We're trying to regulate the use. And that's, that's going to be much more tricky because, you know, he'll go past this a lot of time. He'll do things that he shouldn't be doing and so on. But that's just where we are now. Right. And the, and the key is what does Ray do when his, when his son actually cheats? Tell him not to do it again. <laughs> Known as the Demarshmallow. <laughs> But Fred, I, I, you know, listen, I think you're right. I mean, I think what you're pointing to is, is a comment I made earlier, is that I, I, I hope it's taking place in the U.S. government. You, you would know better since you, um, you served in Congress and Intel Committee for many years. I, I hope that we, we are red teaming our assumptions. And not only red teaming our proposals, but red teaming our assumptions. I certainly think that the key assumptions in recent years that have undergirded this approach to Iran have been that through a series of confidence building measures, right, we can create a positive atmosphere that will lead to a frank exchange between the P5 plus one and Iran over outstanding issues, that the, a series of confidence building measures will lay the predicate for meaningful Iranian concessions, and that those concessions ultimately will lead to a verifiable agreement that will constrain Iran's ability to acquire a nuclear weapon. I mean, I think, and I think those assumptions then in July of last year, on top of that was added the assumption that now we have Rouhani, not Ahmadinejad, uh, and now between the interfactional dispute taking place in Iran between the so-called hardliners representing the Revolutionary Guards and the pragmatists representing Rouhani and Rafsanjani, Zarif and others, our job is to bolster the pragmatists against the Revolutionary Guard and ultimately have Rouhani persuade the Supreme Leader of the benefits of, of nuclear compromise. I mean, those have been the assumptions. Now, whether you agree with those assumptions or you don't agree with the assumptions, I would hope that people in the U.S. government, and I would say I hope in Congress, are red teaming those assumptions. Because what happens if we are fabulously wrong? What if those assumptions prove to be actually the exact opposite? What is our plan B? You know, Ray says that the plan B of the Iranian regime is national poverty. I, I mean, I would slightly disagree. I think the plan B of Khamenei is not national poverty. It's Russia, China, Turkey, and Asia as an escape hatch from Western sanctions and a m modest, modest economy that is not on its knees, that is not on its back, and that's not going to reignite the democratic counter-revolution of 2009, but this time a blue revolution, not just a green revolution, as millions of Iranians outside of the middle-class suburbs of North Tehran say, where's my paycheck? I think that's what the regime fears. And so ultimately, it's, it's got to come down to what is our plan B if our assumptions have been spectacularly wrong? I think, uh, Fred, some of – I have a certain amount of sympathy with the point of view you're articulating, not, not a lot of sympathy, actually. Um, politics, however, also is the art of the possible. If I thought we had an administration – that was ready to, you know, uh, develop a, you know, a root and branch strategy for preventing Iran from getting a bomb, I, I'd feel a lot more comfortable and a lot happier. Um, you know, from where I sit, from my partisan perspective, I'm, you know, quite content with what happened at the minor political event we had a few weeks ago here in the United States. Um, and I think that will help a lot in the Senate, but I don't think right now we could even get uh, necessarily a majority of the Republicans in the Senate to completely repudiate uh, the negotiations at this stage. Um, so some of this is going to turn a little bit on, you know, what we think we're trying to accomplish. Um, I, I think we already have given away a lot in terms of 
allowing Iran to maintain a uh, a near nuclear capability. Um, and in that sense, we have already bought on to if we if we were to succeed, if the administration were to succeed and actually get an agreement that you know the four of us on the panel would say passes the it's not a bad agreement test that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we still are going to be in a position of having to um, uh, be involved in a very long, protracted, expensive effort uh, to keep our eye on this and make sure that it's not violated. And as I mentioned earlier, they're already pushing the edges of this, and you know better than most how hard it is inside the U.S. government to get the government to say when someone is cheating. Just look at how long it's taken us on the INF treaty with the Russians. Um, it's been open secret for several years that the Russians have been violating INF, but it's only recently that the administration has been able to bring itself to actually admit that. Um, so I think that you, the challenges you point out are absolutely right and are going to be enormous. I just think we're so far down the road now, I don't see it, you know, an alternative to trying to hold this um, process to some kind of standard. Um, and if it fails, then we have to go back to the drawing board. And as Mark and Ray were saying, I think red team our, uh, our assumptions and, and perhaps come up with a different, better strategy, perhaps in January of 2017. Dr. Heinen, anything? Maybe. I think this was a good question also raised here. And, but I, I look at it from a different angle, and Eric addressed the story. How to deal with the non-compliance? This has not been discussed very, very much, and if you look at the history of Iran, we have had several cases that they have not really adhered to the agreements which they have made. So we need now to also to think that when there is a non-compliance, that there is a mechanism in place that it has consequences, and it ha the consequences have to be so strong that people really think twice before they enter to the non-compliance and that they know that they don't get away with that. And there should be some, in my view, some agreed minutes to this agreement where, where you define. And, and who defines what? Because this, is it IAEA or is it Security Council or is it P5 plus 1? Who decides on non-compliance here or all together or none of them? Additional questions in the back? Thank you. Uh, Ken Timmerman, the Foundation for Democracy in Iran. I have actually two uh, qu questions. One, a technical question on sanctions for Mark, and another one more of a political question, which perhaps, Eric, you might want to address. Uh, the financial sector sanctions have been prim primarily executive branch sa uh, sanctions imposed by Treasury, as far as I understand. Those, it would seem, uh, could be uh, taken away by executive action and not by congressional action. For example, the U-turn transactions, the ban on U-turn transactions in, in New York. What is your view on that? Do you think the administration is going to do that? What's the timing on that? The political question I have, uh, Eric, for, for you and perhaps for the others as well, uh, everyone is talking about bringing this agreement to Congress. The president has said he won't bring the agreement to Congress. Uh, I talked to Ed Roy Royce over the weekend. He said, well, Secretary C Kerry has promised that he'll come to Congress and defend the agreement. Well, the, if the president doesn't want Secretary Kerry to present the agreement to the Senate for a vote, he will not do that. So how, what is the measure to compel the president to actually submit this agreement to Congress, to the Senate specifically, for some kind of review, uh, uh, oversight, and a vote? Ken, I'll, I'll take the, the sanctions question first, and it's a very good one. Um, so the answer actually is not quite. The, the, actually, the strongest financial sanction that's been put in place has been put in place by Congress, and that is that the Central Bank of Iran was legislatively designated under 1245 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which was a measure that was co-authored by, by Senators Kirk and Menendez. And that is a legislative designation, the Central Bank of Iran, which is the key pillar of Iran's entire financial sector. In addition, the Section 311 finding under the Patriot Act, where the Treasury Department found that Iran's entire financial sec sector was a jurisdiction of primary money laundering concern, 
that that too has actually been uh, enshrined in in congressional legislation and so the, the the at the very heart of the financial sanctions regime are those congressional designations and that's part of congressional law now the president can use national security waivers he can suspend sanctions he can allow oil exports to go back up there's a variety of things he can do he certainly cannot lift those sanctions and until the president can come back and certify the following iran is no longer a state sponsor of terrorism and iran has verifiably dismantled its nuclear chemical, biological, ballistic missile, and ballistic missile launch technology programs. Those are criteria that President Obama himself signed into law in 2010 in Sasada and strengthened in, in, in ITRA in 2012, both of which passed with huge bipartisan majorities. Right, 99 to zero. So that, those are the termination criteria. Now, you're right, the president can, using executive orders, de-designate Iranian financial institutions but not the Central Bank of Iran. Um, there are 24 Iranian banks that have been designated by Treasury, one for terrorism purposes, 23 for proliferation-sensitive related, but proliferation-sensitive is not just nuclear, it's also ballistic missiles, of which eight of those have been designated for their ties to the Revolutionary Guards. The Revolutionary Guards will remain a designated terrorist organization, I assume. The administration is not anytime soon lifting that designation. And so they can use de-designations, they can use executive orders, which is why one of the things that I've called for in a report that I wrote with Senator Kirk's former Deputy Chief of Staff, Rich Goldberg, is for Congress to submit a rehabilitation program to, sorry, the Treasury to submit a rehabilitation program to Congress under which banks will be de-designated. And for Congress to approve that rehabilitation program with established benchmarks, and for Treasury to come back to Congress every time it wants to de-designate an Iranian bank to demonstrate that it's met those benchmarks, right? So the Iranian banks just don't get out of jail for free, right? Like any convicted prisoner, right? If they've served their term, they go into a rehabilitation program, right? And they have to actually check in with their parole officer, and they don't get released into the general population until the prison system is confident that they will no longer return to to a life of crime. And these banks have been conducting financial crimes for decades. And so it's one of the ways in which Congress can build a legislative firewall against the precipitous unwinding of financial sanctions. And as I mentioned earlier, Congress, I think, has a very strong legislative framework with a central bank sanction to do that. Ken, you raise a really good question, um, and and I, before I try and actually answer it, let me give a little bit of a prologue here. I, I actually find it very disturbing that the administration has chosen to approach the Congress during the course of this entire issue in the way that it, in the manner that it has. Um, and you see that in the context of the way that the administration has fought the various efforts by Senators Kirk and Menendez uh, along the way. And I, I've characterized it in the past as tooth and nail. Um, and uh, I think it's an apt, apt characterization of the way that they've tried to hold back these sanctions. When in fact, as a matter, you know, as a former diplomat, I mean, I, I think it's just bad negotiating practice to have done that because the prospect of those sanctions should have been brandished, you know, as uh, a club when they were in the room with the Iranians. Uh, and frankly, if I were the Iranians right now, I'd actually be demanding that the administration take this agreement to the Congress because I wouldn't want to sign after what happened last, you know, uh, earlier this month, three weeks ago, um, I wouldn't want to sign an agreement with this administration um, not knowing who's going to, you know, come in 2016 and whether even a Democratic administration in, in 27, January 2017 might have a different view of this. Um, so, you know, from a lot of points of view, it seems to me to be just, and as I said earlier, I think when you deal, when it's a big deal like this, just it's good, you know, practice, democratic practice, lower case D, to, to you know, bring it to the Congress. So I, I find it extremely distressing that the administration's approached the entire question uh, in the manner that it has. Um, 
Ray and I have actually given a fair amount of thought to this problem um, and tried to come up with some ways. I mean, in the past, there were people in the Congress, uh, like Senator Jackson, uh, who, when arms control agreements were uh, being reached, and, and, I mean, there were questions about, we, we tend to forget that the um, strategic arm limitation agreement of 1972 uh, it, it was not a treaty. Um, and all the ABM treaty had to be submitted to the Senate for ratification. There was a question in the Nixon administration about whether the assault agreement would be submitted to the Congress. You know, in the end, President Nixon, um, in, in his wisdom, saw fit to uh, send it to the Congress for, a, a, um, a, a, for both houses, I guess, for a, a, a joint resolution of, of support. Um, I find it astonishing that an administration that said it would be the most transparent administration in history is going to fail to meet the Nixon standard. Um, so uh, I think you know um, I think naming and shaming the administration is one one thing. I think I, I don't we, we um, you asserted the president's not going to do it. I don't know that to be a fact yet. Um, I mean I I understand that's a predilection. Uh, I hope it doesn't become a fact. Uh, the president has in his environs uh, with Vice President Biden, Sec uh, Senator, uh, Secretary Hagel, Secretary Kerry, and I did the math in my head, so don't hold me to this, but I think it's roughly about 75 man years of service on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. You know, I would hope that they would exert their influence to, to you know, um, change that predisposition. Um, but, you know, in the end of the day, I mean, this is not the only issue on which uh, the Congress is going to have to face the issue of potential executive overreach, um, and there is the power of the purse, and there are other mechanisms by which the Congress, uh, you, know, will you know, will have at its disposal to try and, and force the administration's hand a little bit. Um, and I hope they take advantage of those if we end up there, but I hope we don't end up there. I hope cooler heads prevail and that this does get uh, sent to the Congress for some form of, of uh, support, ratification, whatever. Can I, I'll just say a few things about this. Uh, uh, I, I think, and I'm not part of the council, that the administration does have a legislative strategy. Uh, and I have to say that I think it's a clever one. Um, their strategy would be any, any agreement with Iran will be a multi-stage agreement, stage one, stage two, stage three, whatever. Uh, and I think their plan is, I think, uh, to suggest during the first stage though sanctions relief will come in form of presidential waivers. This way you build some momentum behind an agreement uh, if both sides agree to the mutual restraints in the stage one. There may be some issues that require re-adjudication. And then in stage two or whatever, when they need congressional relief, they'll come to Congress and say, we have a successful arms control agreement. It is succeeding. We need sanctions relief. And, you know, if you don't pass sanctions relief, you own this issue. You are responsible for breaking a successful arms control agreement and witnessing the resumption of various Iranian activities and threatening to produce enriched uranium up to 60%. I think that would be a very tough call for U.S. Congress at that point. And the way this issue is going, it is entirely possible that stage two will start, will be the first decision that the next president has to make. You know, if the, if the first stage is two years, if they negotiated a comprehensive agreement and they get there, so you're the next president, you coming in in January 17, the first issue you want to do is break out an arms control agreement uh, and, and all the crises and tensions and uh, I think Eric is correct, and I think others here suggest that for this agreement to have durability and, and they require some sort of a national consensus, and the national consensus can best be expressed through some sort of a legislative approbation. But they, you know, this, you know, you'll be asking a lot of congressmen and senators to make a tough call. Uh, and I'm not sure how that issue will play out, but that, that's, I, I think that's where this is going. So, I mean, I just add one other thing. There is actually a bill, as many of you know, um, that was introduced by Senators Corker and Graham McCain, Rubio, and I think it has some seven, eight or 
other co-sponsors um, and, and building, and that's to put any agreement to a vote. On, uh, well, so it would be – so it depends on, on how it plays, but the, the current legislation, which is called the Iran Nuclear Negotiations Act, would essentially require the administration to put an agreement uh, within three days of signing to Congress, 15 days of hearings, and then a joint resolution of disapproval would be introduced in both the House and Senate, and basically members of Congress would have to vote. And I guess the, the, the rationale for that is votes have consequences, and we're going to get people on record. And I guess as Senator Kirk mentioned, he thinks he can count on the support of um, most of his Republican colleagues. So in, say, January, February, that's roughly 52, 54, depending on how you count it. And the 17 Democrats who currently co-sponsor Menendez-Kirk, some have been uh, defeated. There will be new members. Many will, will be up for re-elect 2016. And I guess the assumption is that they can gather enough votes on the Democratic side for essentially the U.S. Congress to vote the deal down. Now, I think Gray's right. I mean, the administration has uh, thought this through, has, has red teamed it, and is, is certainly um, will probably resort to what was a very effective tactic last fall to stall the Menendez-Kirk bill, which is to essentially paint senators as warmongers, including members of their own party. Um, I think I think they'll likely see the attempt to roll that out again. But that is one way that that could happen. Now, the binding element of that is that the Corker bill contains some some triggers where if, if the president do doesn't introduce the agreement or doesn't allow the agreement to go to a vote, uh, it would trigger the reimposition of sanctions. And also through the appropriations process, they would cut off funding to the executive branch, to those offices responsible for enforcing the deal. I mean, you could see where this would go. But even a non-binding resolution, as, as Ray mentioned, would have political consequences. And if the president were to lose that vote, it certainly would undercut the political legitimacy of the deal and lay the predicate for Congress to do other things that would um, probably be um, rather constraining for the administration. So that, that is another alternative. I, I completely agree with Ray on the phased approach to sanctions relief. I think that's exactly what the Iranians are counting on. And the Iranians, through the JPOA process, kept saying, we are breaking sanctions. You know, it wasn't only FDD saying that. It was the Iranians actually saying, we are breaking the sanctions because we are looking at our own macroeconomic indicators. We are seeing the fact that we are now in a, in a recovery. And I think they believe in phase one, raise phase one, that the, the momentum, the durability of sanctions relief will become, un, become sustainable over any congressional objections or any attempt to snap back the sanctions. So they believe if they can get past phase one with enough of those sanctions relieved and the business environment sufficiently changed, that it would be very difficult for, for the next president, the next Congress, to actually snap back sanctions and reverse that economic momentum. You know, I just add one thing. I, I, I think the politics of this are, are beginning to shift a little bit. Um, what Mark was talking about, the tactic that the administration used, which was to paint, uh, to pick those who uh, supported the sanctions as warmongers, was actually just uh, a, a replay of um, the uh, line they used in the 2012 campaign against Governor Romney and against those of us who were working on the Romney campaign. Um, and in the context of the president saying the tide of war is receding in the region, Americans are tired of being involved in too long and difficult wars, we're putting them to an end, etc. Uh, you know, that may, might, and, and oh, by the way, in a period when the president's approval rating for his foreign policy uh, was even higher than his uh, personal approval rating going into the 2012 election, that, that made a certain amount of political sense and clearly had, you know, a certain amount of effect. Um, Today, I think that looks a little different. Um, with 3,000 troops in Iraq fighting airstrikes, you know, CENTCOM carrying out airstrikes in Syria and Iraq, um, the, the region in, in tremendous uh, turmoil, Iranian proxies uh, occupying Sana'a in Yemen, um, the, the attacks in, in, the, uh, in Jerusalem yesterday, all of this is beginning to look a little different, I think. 
in any event, I think public opinion has, I think Iran uh, getting a nuclear weapon has always been an exception in, in uh, public opinion polls. There has been consistent support, and it's always around the high 50s for actually taking military action uh, in order to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. If it comes to that, and when you poll Americans and say, do you think if we can't do it any other way that we should use military action, it's about 50 to 57 percent usually say yes. Um, and the president's approval rating for the conduct of his foreign policy now is well below his overall approval rating, which is very low as well. Um, and I think the other political factor that's changed is since he's never going to be on the ballot again and just cost the Democrats the Senate, um, I think there are a lot of members who are going to start posturing themselves differently. I think Senator Warner's statement uh, today about Iran is the first indication that only winning by 16,000 votes might, you know, concentrate your mind on this subject. So, I don't know how many Senator Warner's statement, um, but take a look at it. It's, it's really interesting because um, he talks about dismantling Iran's program. Uh, he talks about intrusive uh, anywhere or any time, anywhere inspections. Uh, he talks about a very slow process of sanctions relief tied very specifically to Iranian compliance. And um, he may have only won by 16,000 votes, but he's, he's not up for re-elect in 2016. So the interesting political calculation will be for those who are up for re-elect in 2016, whether they support Senator Warner. So with that, I believe our, our time is drawing to a close. Uh, and I think the, the, the message that I've heard here is stay tuned. Uh, no matter what, what happens on Monday, there's going to be a lot more analysis to do that I'm sure will be forthcoming from all three of our organizations and a lot more debate to be had about the merits of any deal that comes out or a framework agreement or an extension. So uh, stay tuned, and we uh, sure will be back. Thank you.